can you describe then the nature of the collaboration between yourselves? Well, um, you know, I've been kicking around this idea of making a film with Frank Ryan for a period of time, and obviously when you do that, you start as a sort of director to look at all the secondary literature, and of course one of the books was Fergal's book, and it, by lucky coincidence, the two of us were working in the same institution at Queen's University in Belfast, so that provided, you know, the framework and opportunity for us to interact on a virtually on a daily basis. So it seemed natural to, to go to Fergal in the first instance to, to seek, you know, the role of a historical consultant, to ask him to perform that role. Um, he'd written on it, um, I thought, highly of the book, um, but also he, the book reviews a number of other texts, so it was good leverage in terms of understanding the other critical takes on, on Frank Ryan. I mean, the, the conventional role of the, the historical consultant in the film is really, it's really very limited. I mean, in the first place, as, as was the case with Des, there's usually a script, you know, so really you're just kind of advising on matters of, of detail, you know, and, what song would they have sung in the period, or what, what was the language they would have used? Um, perhaps a little bit more advising on the, the dynamics between different political figures and you know, that kind of level of interpretive detail. But on, on this project, I suppose, where, where we would have had more kind of collaboration would be in terms of the reception of the film, you know, in terms of um, public debates, uh, developing a website of interpretive resources, um, and in that sense, using the film as a way into exploring um, the history. The context you know, for this collaboration is very much a, you know, a sort of public cultural one, you know, working as we both do in the universities um, and working you know, funded by public service television. It's very natural for us to concern ourselves not just with the production but the dissemination of the film, dissemination obviously via broadcast but via you know, um, screenings which facilitate for the audience an opportunity for a discussion and therefore open the film out into a broader you know, public discourse about history and about particularly republicanism in the Second World War. Um, not every filmmaker has that sort of opportunity to do that, uh, most of them work within severe constraints set by the commercial nature of filmmaking. Um, in a sense, you know, I've had the luxury to work between that world and an academic world, and that uh, provides opportunities you know, for the sorts of uh, um, work of dissemination as a public educational project, um, and that was quite an important element of it. And again, as Fergal says, this is uh, you know, how we collaborated and cooperated together in the dissemination and in the public discussion around the film. I mean, the, our collaboration evolved quite naturally because Des and I were working together. Anyways, Des was making the film. As I was working as a consultant. And then we got support from the Arts and Humanities Research Council who gave us quite a substantial grant so that we could move from just working together to actually developing it into a, a, a project that would reflect more critically on how do historians and filmmakers work, what are the problems in conveying historical sto st stories on screen. And also it gave us a lot of resources so that we could have some kind of um, influence and put some um, quite, quite a level of resources into the, the afterlife of the film. What do you feel that you've learned then about this filmmaker-historian collaboration? If, if you were to do it all again, what would you do differently? You said you'd start working earlier. Yeah, I think to, to collaborate from the very outset would be useful. I think when you reach the state, when you come in as a historic consultant with a script, there's really not an awful lot um, that you can do other than perhaps um, you know, have some discussion around the, the details and so on. So I think a, a, a collaboration from the outset could be a more productive one. Having said that, it's, it, there's also problems with that because at the end of the day, this, isn't, uh, this is, this is Des, Des's film. And a film, it's a film based on history, but it's, you know, it, it's also a work of creative um, art and you know there are limitations to the degree of collaboration that can come about um, as a result um, of that. I think you know within the world of film studies, the critical world of film studies, you know we are rethinking the notion of authorship within sort of film and uh, you know documentary film that the, the the attribution of authorship is always more problematic than it is a straightforward fiction film. Now this is a hybrid; it is neither straightforward documentary nor is it straightforward. Uh, dramatic film um, and the question of authorship yes it clearly you know there is a script there's a director and the director has the primary creative responsibility but the nature of filmmaking in general is that the forms of collaboration 
uh, you know, with the cameraman, with the designer, with the actors, of course, in, uh, in, in arriving at a performance. Um, and of course, then with the historian, these are all forms of collaborative activity, which the director has a watching brief over, but, you know, involve uh, in some ways a diminution of the pure idea of authorship, which I think, you know, um, may have perfect sense within the world of literature, but within the world of film, which after all, you know, is a collaborative communal activity involving large numbers of people and substantial resources marshaled within a very tight time frame. Uh, none of those things lend themselves to the traditional forms of authorship as envisaged you know within within uh, literature I think also one, one of the challenges with, with with historical film is that you're 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 working for different audiences. There are some people who just want to see the story of Frank Ryan and they want an entertaining story and they'll pick up some of the background history and, and, and that's that's well and fine. But on, on another level, Des is trying to make a sort of serious engagement with, with the history itself. He's reflecting on the history and he's also engaging with the historiography. And it's, it's, it's quite difficult to do that. And I think that's where the collaboration between the historian and the not only the director but also the writer would be very useful at an early stage because really often what you're doing with, with, with film is, tr is trying to convey almost in emblematic scenes much more kind of complex um, historiographical debates and arguments. Um, so, so that's somewhere where I think historians should have an input but, but often they don't because of the, the, the different kind of requirements, particularly the commercial requirements of film um, and, and also what film is, is, is trying to do. I mean, film is, is a popular medium, but one wants to believe that it's an intelligent popular medium which requires and requests its audience to interrogate what they're seeing in various sort of ways. Now, not all film does that, and the more commercial, you know, the film framework, the more difficult it is to engage and encourage that type of interrogation from an audience. But um, uh, certainly, uh, you have to entertain <laughs> I mean, that's the, you know, the sine qua non you know, of the filmmaker. They have to provide a form of entertainment, a form of engagement, a form of emotional engagement. Uh, and all those things are not necessarily part and parcel of the armory of an historian. Historians want to, to some extent, uh, engage and entertain, but by and large, you know, the, shall we say, the scientific and the evidential basis of historiographic uh, activity militates against. Uh, on the other hand, for the filmmaker, the, sometimes the desire to achieve narrative and expressive effects can lead to a diminution of the authenticity or the historical accuracy as characters can be conflated, as action can be compressed, uh, as certain ellipses you know, in the historical record occur in the interests of uh, sim simplifying the story or increasing the, you know, the degree of conflict, emotional conflict operative in a particular part of the story. So there is a trade-off, and I suppose one of the things in this project that we've been interested in is to know, you know how an historian and how a filmmaker conceive that trade-off and how they live with it and how they make sense of it. Um, and again, to some extent, we're trying to reflect upon that now um, and write about it and share those debates, um, which sometimes get reduced to very simplistic arguments about you know, the historically authentic, uh, uh, rather than trying to, 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 to ask the question, how can film as a set of cultural and representational practices interact with history making, seeking new audiences and seeking new forms of public uh, encounter? I think, I mean, I think historical films are essentially trying to tell uh, a, a, a story in a dramatic fashion, but without sacrificing historical integrity and all sort of complexity and nuance that, that's involved with that. And in some senses, it's, it's sort of impossible to do this, at least if you compare it to the alternative, which is the, the historian's monograph, and you've got hundreds and hundreds of pages. And historians love complexity and ambiguity and considering multiple perspectives and multiple interpretations. And that's something that, that is difficult to convey in film, particularly the sort of multiple points of view or making clear what you don't know and where the gaps are and so on. Um, so I think in terms of our, our, our collaboration, you know, a key question I think in any sort of historian's involvement with, with historical film is you have to do all the things that Des has said. You have to simplify stories, move around the timescale of events, conflate characters and so on. But, but, but ultimately, the question is, you know, where do you draw the line? What, what kind of changes do you make that, that begin to sort of devalue the historical utility of a film? I mean, the, 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 that gets us into the issue of sort of um, 
uh, you know, bias and objectivity. And I suppose the, 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 the craft of writing history as a historian places great premium on weighing the evidence objectively and openly and uh, adopting a sort of a, a dispassionate, um, disinterested, as much as is possible, objective view. And it seems to me, you know, I partly accept some of what Des is saying. I mean, sometimes there are criticisms of films like The Wind That Shakes the Barley, which are, are, are partly because of their ideological bias. Indeed, most of the, the, the historians' criticisms of films set in the revolutionary period usually, or at least part of what they object to, is the fact that they, they represent a republican or nationalist viewpoint, that they don't um, represent a sort of a, a more neutral kind of perspective. So it's perhaps partly an ideological element. But I do also think there's an element to this which relates to the, the medium themselves. So when you're writing as a historian, you're trying to give a sense of the, the different ways of looking at something. You're usually at pains to emphasize that there is a unionist perspective, there's a republican perspective, there's a perspective of, 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 of the, the British authorities and so on and so on. When, when you're making a film, you're usually invited to identify with just a single perspective, the, the perspective of the, 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 the main character. And of course, because filmmakers tend to make films about the same types of subject, whether it be Frank Ryan or Michael Collins, I think there, this does raise a problem which is not just to do with the ideology of you know, whether people agree or, or don't agree with the ideology of the character, but also to do with the medium itself, because the medium of film struggles to, to show you the other perspectives. And, 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 and that's something that historians are uncomfortable with. I think it'd probably be more accurate to say that the, it's the medium of dramatic film that has that limitation. Obviously, in a documentary, you can represent multi-viewpoints. You can interview different uh, you know, academics, uh, political figures um, who can reminisce about the past uh, and also can arrive at you know, scholarly judgment and bring from entirely different political and ideological perspectives. It's really the structure of the dramatic film with its uh, notion you know, that you're trying to encourage the audience to empathize with the hero or the central character. Uh, and, and in that act, act of empathy, um, you know, th there is some identification with the political perspective and the position, and that comes to sort of dominate the, the film effectively from that point of view then on unfurls itself. The, the genre that you're working in, Des, I think is particularly interesting because it's, it's, it's making a kind of a historical docudrama. It's, it's somewhere in between the realm of you know, conventional history, uh, evidence-based archives and so on, and the historical film where there's much more kind of um, use of imagination. And it, for me, as an academic historian, it's interesting to work in that area. And, and there is, of course, I think what you're, what you're getting at, there is a slightly subversive element to this because historians very much like to think and talk about objectivity and the archival record and the sources and so on. What they're much more uncomfortable thinking about is uh, the narrative devices that they use to tell historical stories. But, but indeed they do. They, they, they choose what perspectives to, to show, what information to um, reveal, uh, when to begin and end the story and so on. And generally historians aren't as upfront and as conscious and as self-critical about these things as, as, as they ought to be. So, so I do think to that extent um, historians have got things to learn about uh, in terms of uh, working with film. Mm -hmm. I mean I would have thought that the notion of an unreliable narrator is a bit of a nightmare for an historian. Um, personally I was quite comfortable with the, 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 the concept. The kind of documentaries that I'm more used to working with are films where you have a sort of um, archival um, record of the visual archival record of the past, maybe some reconstructions, and then a kind of a voice of God uh, voiceover. And, and of course, the, the purpose of the sort of voice of God uh, narrator is to uh, essentially mimic the, the historian. So it's like you're getting a sort of a very cr um, uh, crude version of the historical text. You're getting this authoritative historical account. And I think, in a sense, that's not actually necessarily the medium strength and necessarily what, what, what documentary does as well. Whereas if you have the unreliable narrator, it's, it's immediately obvious to most of the audience that actually what, what you're not getting is, is some authoritative historical voice, but rather you're getting uh, a voice that encourages you to sort of ask questions um, and think about it and, and wonder, uh, are you getting the truth? Yeah, because you have uh, in um, The Enigma of Frank Ryan, or indeed uh, the film I was referring to, um, One Man's War, the, the Kozarinsky film, you, know, you have this, ob in a sense, objective data running through it, which is the archive, which is you know how Paris was in in, in the summer of 1940, um, or how Berlin was um, 
you know, at various periods that we're trying to represent. So it is this sort of ironic thing is that there is a sort of foundation and more and more uh, you know, fiction filmmakers are using for quite often for economic reasons, or storytelling reasons, they're using elements of archive. You know, Oliver Stone has done this in a number of films. Um, and it's quite a normal way now to, you know, to portray the, you know, the, the recent past, the last 50 years, by using archive to set up the frame within which the drama will then unfold. Um, but if you do it more systematically, it does raise all these issues about the sort of truth status of the documentary material, i.e. the archive, as opposed to the untruth status, put it crudely, of the unreliable narrator. And it's bringing these two into tension, as you know, Kozarinski does brilliantly with uh, one, uh, one Man's War, and we do, I think, not quite as successfully, uh, constrained a bit by the norms of broadcasting in Ireland in terms of uh, um, the enigma of Frank Ryan. But it is those tensions which actually raise all sorts of questions, you know, about the nature of the archive, you know, the framing of the picture, um, you know, the treatment of the visual archive as, a, as historically problematic. Yeah. Um, well, if I could go back to this question of archival material, reconstruction and dramatic voiceover, that combination of those, is it simply a matter of using reconstruction where the archival material doesn't exist? Or are there places in the film where you chose deliberately to use reconstruction rather than existing archival material? Yeah, I mean, there are different um, sensibilities that filmmakers bring to bear in this. I mean, for some filmmakers, the ideal is to have archive that will cover every element of the storytelling that they want to engage in. Um, and therefore, it is a question of, uh, you know, with an infinite resource of visual archive, you can tell your story. Now, there's usually all sorts of practical constraints on that. Uh, you have to pay for the stuff in terms of the use of rights. You have to find it. And apart from that, the further you go back, the more uh, diminished becomes, you know, the opportunity of finding archive that's going to cover your period. So over the last 50 years, you know, if you go back to the Second World War, clearly we have uh, the use of, uh, you know, um, film camera and newsreel traditions. Uh, if you go back to the First World War, it gets very thin on the ground. We have one or two films which were entirely, which were documentaries, but were reconstructed documentaries, in, say, of the, of the British forces, uh, the song film, for instance. Um, but you were very limited. If you go back even further, you know, you're in just a still images. And if you go back beyond, you know, 1844, 1850, you could say effectively, there are no photographic images of any sort. You know, so the visual trail starts to become very thin altogether. So uh, always filmmakers are stuck with the economy problem of how the limited number of images and clips and the availability of those, the cost of those, um, and uh, reconstruction has very often emerged as a pragmatic response to how you tell a story and visualize a story where there isn't archive or the archive is too expensive to acquire um, or the archive is insufficiently detailed um, and expressive in terms of actually letting you tell your story. Once you start on the slippery slope of <laughs> reconstruction, you know, it poses all sorts of questions. Either you minimize it and do what people used to talk about as, um, you know, Ertzatz archive, where you actually sort of treat your archive, you know, to treat your live action as an extension of the archive principle, um, on occasion giving it a visual treatment to make it look like old archive, silent movie, or whatever. This sort of Ertzatz um, archive is highly problematic. Um, it's highly problematic not least because very often you call upon actors to cooperate and collaborate in this activity and to remain silent and to do everything, you know, to, to avoid doing the sort of expressive performances that an actor naturally does. So, I, I mean, I, having tried this a few times and been really quite unhappy with the direction of actors who are prevented from acting <laughs> effectively and become mannequins, um, you, know, to be, you know, to be moved around to, to enable reconstructions to give a visual sense, but not a dramatic uh, expression of a particular uh, historical event or encounter, that just seemed to be highly unsatisfactory. And uh, certainly I've evolved towards you know, treating the actor with some respect and allowing them to, to contribute to the elaboration of the script and, of course, to the performance of roles. Um, and I think, I think, you know, as people talk about, you know, documentary and fiction film coming closer together and overlap and fuzzy, fuzzy boundaries, 
um, it has really created a, at the creative level quite a challenge as to how you, uh, you know, how you deal with this. In some sense, the pure uh, documentary archival film remains, you know, perfect in what it is if you can find the archive to do this. Um, the film that is uh, uh, using the EarthSats archival live action approach, uh, simulated archive effectively, it seems to me always to undermine yourself in various sorts of ways. So it seems to me that uh, you know, what is needed is an imaginative way to bring the, uh, you know, the power of photographic realism that archive has together with the power of dramatic action, which only an actor and an actor performance and a directed actor's performance can produce. And that's certainly the challenge that I set myself you know, in uh, The Enigma of Frank Ryan. Whether it was pulled off in all the cases, I don't know, but certainly that was the challenge. And that, that's much harder to do uh, in terms of budgets, in terms of resources, in terms of uh, design. Uh, you know, because all the questions of authenticity of the historical film. You know, all the are the clothes right? Are the haircuts right? You know, those which in a straightforward documentary are not so exacting become exacting in in a film which starts to have a reconstruction and starts to have live dramatic action sequences uh, and all those uh, pitfalls potentially have not putting off those elements, you know, of the historical reconstruction. Because audiences are very, you know, audiences think they know what the past looks like. Sometimes these are total, uh, you know, misrepresentations of the past, but there are various iconic codes of, uh, iconic codes of how they think the past should look like, that if you don't achieve, will in the mind of the audience undermine the historical authenticity, you know, of the filmic text. Well, I suppose the issue that I initially imagined would be the most controversial would be the fact that we're making a film about a person who for many Republicans is a, is a hero and inevitably in the film we're focusing on the most controversial part of his life which is his journey to Germany and his role as what I and many other people would suggest would be as a, as a collaborator and indeed before the film was even uh, uh, began shooting um, it had been you know, criticised from some quarters as... Denounced, I think is the word. <laughs> denounced, uh, you know, for, for, for maligning Ryan's uh, name. The film invites you to empathise. And with Dara Devaney's excellent acting and um, uh, with, with the, uh, the script, you, you are uh, asked to sort of identify with Ryan and, and, and you, 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 you view his, his, his position with some sympathy. Whereas when you're reading... A historical text, which is sort of, you know, in a dispassionate way, critically looking at what Ryan did and the the, the, the moral kind of problems about that, um, you respond to it differently. So my 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 text was re received a lot of criticism from Republican and left wing um, um, quarters, whereas the film hasn't. I mean, I mean, of course, the film isn't a book; they are different. But what does this film is in terms of the interpretation? It's actually much the same. Um, and so, so I think the the softened attitude to that is partly because people are sympathising and they can see that in in, in Des's case that there is some kind of sympathy with the position of Ryan that is not as much an issue in a historical text. Yes, I guess you know the, the filmmaker is much more circumspect of making an authoritative judgment. I mean, the historian very often, you know, writing his book or her book against other texts that are in the field and are making counter arguments, you know, wants at the end to make an authoritative judgment on a character. It was a character like Ryan, who's problematic in terms of his time in, in, in Berlin and his relationship to the Nazi regime. There's, this, there's a, you know, um, certainly a temptation for the historian to arrive at, at an authoritative judgment. I'm not saying that filmmakers don't make judgments. They, they certainly do, um, and they make judgments. But those judgments are embedded, really, as you say, in, in, the, in, in, the, in the, the warp and the weft of the film itself and the development of the character and the development of the life of the film. Um, so the, the judgments don't manifest themselves in the written text the way that the conclusion of a book will try and arrive at some definitive statement you know, about an historical character. But we wouldn't be arriving at a definitive statement. What I think we would be saying is, yes, this was highly problematic, this visit to Berlin, this sojourn in Berlin. Um, and you know, what do you think about it? 
at an audience. <laughs> What's your judgment? In other words, we really would invite people to, you know, to, 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 to ask the question rather than being, feel that we were in the, confidently in the position where we could arrive at a definitive judgment, authoritative judgment about, about the character. Yeah, I mean, as a historian, I'd be uncomfortable saying that I arrive at authoritative and definitive judgments. But, but, but what I do do as a historian is I sort of explicitly weigh the evidence, assess the, the varying alternative explanations and viewpoints, and, and come, ultimately come to a judgment. In, in, in my case, that Frank Ryan was um, you know, a, a, a collaborator. I think also there's another context to, why, to the, the way in which the film was received, and that is you know, the political context. And Ryan's story has always been a very political story. And if you, if you look at Ryan's kind of legacy, when he died uh, in, in, uh, towards the end of the Second World War, there was a kind of a silence back in Ireland. Uh, there was an, a, a plan initially to, author, to have an authorised biography. And when it transpired that he had been in Germany, his Republican friends were frankly embarrassed and, and little was said about it. And then you get Ryan's rehabilitation in the 1970s as very much a kind of a, a, a useful Republican figure who brings together Republicanism and, and the left. And of course, his involvement in the Spanish Civil War is seen very much as anti-fascism, pro-democracy, and he becomes a kind of hero of progressive um, causes. Um, and if you look at what's written about Ryan in the sort of 70s and 80s, it tends to be kind of polarised. Uh, Republican figures and historians write about him in an admiring way, and academics often write about him in a way which shows some of the, the, the problems and limitations of Republican ideology. You know, Ryan is pointed to as undermining the view that there's something intrinsically progressive about Republicanism, because here we have the IRA's alliance with, with Germany. And the fact that this film was made and came out, I think, in the, in the peace process era, I think is significant and, and influences its reception, because I think basically, in, in, in part, the heat has died out, a little bit of that very polarised uh, political debate about Irish history and, and the history of republicanism against the background of the Troubles. But also, uh, I think Republicans themselves are much more relaxed about their history. And, and well, we've had a number of events when we've invited in Republican figures, figures from Sinn Féin and so on. And I think whereas in the past there would have been a lot of defence about, defensiveness about the relationship between the IRA and Nazi Germany, I think they're much more willing to look at it in an, in an open-minded way. So, so, that, so that the context is always changing and I think that affects how books and films are received. The question of the death camps is, is that... Yeah, I mean, one, for, for me as a kind of historian, one of, the, one of the difficulties with the film is that the audience watching the film doesn't realize and in fact it's very it's very difficult for them to know what parts of the film are based on evidence and sources and, and, and what parts are essentially um, uh, made made up um, and the inclusion of a scene about the death camps is in this for me as a historian kind of problematic. I mean, I always defer to Des as the filmmaker the, the, the logic of the film must dictate the, the scenes that you put in uh, and I think all you can do as a consultant is asked the question about a scene for which there's no evidence, in this case Frank Ryan being very critical of the, the, what the Nazis are doing in terms of the, the final solution, all you can do is ask the question, is, does that seem plausible? In, in the case of this particular scene, I think it, it probably is plausible to a point because Ryan was clearly an anti-fascist, um, he had, as editor of Unfublic, he'd, he'd criticised the treatments of the Jews and so on. But it raises a host of other questions, I mean the, the fact that Frank Ryan stayed alive as late as he did in uh, Nazi Germany, suggests that he, he was you know, pretty discreet. Um, so, so ultimately we don't know, but I suppose the, the question that, that needs to be asked is, you know, at, at, at what point is it legitimate to, to, in, to invent scenes? And one of my problems as a historian is that it's not clear to the public um, the extent that's been done. And, and, and another kind of issue is that it's often clear after we've screened the film and had public debates that a certain proportion of people assume because it's a, a docudrama, because it's based in a documentary format, that everything in it is, is true. Um, and you know, that's one of the reasons why we have developed the, the interpretive resources and so on and have to sort of to make explicit, you know, where we have departed from the historical record. And for me as a historian, one of the great limitations of film is it's difficult to make explicit where you depart from the record and where you, you, where you embellish and where, as Des would say, you reimagine or you, you, know, you take leaps in the dark. I mean, the, the, the historical film isn't a historical text and I think if you're going to work with film, your, your starting point must be you know, to accept that. And the, the film and storytelling has its own kind of narrative um, logic that you have to go with. So for, for me as a historian, the, the, you have to return to that question of 
does this cross the line of what's historically acceptable? Does it distort um, the essence of, of the, the historical actuality? So in the case of this scene, although it's somewhat troubling because there's no evidence to suggest that Ryan was so outspoken against um, the Holocaust, it did make a kind of historical sense because really what, what the scene was saying is that Ryan had, by going to Germany and by events not going his way, invasion of Ireland and Britain not taking place and so on, um, Ryan had become deeply compromised and regretted his presence in Germany. And it seems to me that, that, that the essence of what the scene is saying doesn't actually you know, compromise um, you know, the, the wider historical story. And I, I think that's the, the kind of litmus test you have to ask. And we can think of historical films where they make decisions, which I think just you know, cross that line and devalue the historical film. Yeah, and I think there's a bit of a compromise in the film. But these are the sorts of trade-offs that I think you know, the, the, the filmmaker makes you know, in, in, a, in a conversation with history. Um, and uh, it, no filmmaker, I think, willingly wishes to distort history. Uh, it's usually the pressures of, of dramatic form or other factors that come, come to bear rather than... I mean, it's possible the filmmakers would willingly wish to mis mislead Certain, revisionism, is, revisionism is just as possible in filmmaking as it is in historiography. But by and large, uh, my perception would be that you know historians, uh, filmmakers wish to be ac uh, accurate in terms of the historical record, but you know realize that the dramatic form itself leads to certain um, you know reshaping of the historical record. Yeah, and I, and I think for, for my part as an academic historian, I think academic historians need to be more aware of those kind of um, that those kind of things are necessary. Um, because the, the default approach of historians is, is, is really to judge the film against the textbook and to adopt a rather you know, pedantic perspective and start detailing omissions and changes. By no means unique to historians because one of the complaints that uh, you know, literary scholars have with regards to you know, uh, the adaptation of novels uh, or other literary sources into films is precisely the same. That there's not, again, it's not in this case a question of historical accuracy, it's a question of, of, of textual accuracy, that characters are misrepresented or, or removed completely, elisions take place, compressions. I mean, if you were to compare the sort of criticisms, particularly, you know, um, uh, you know some of the big uh, novels, the Jane Austen novels, you know, how literary scholars relate to you know the popular films that emerge, it's usually with great disdain, and it's you know there's a parallel discourse there to the way historians and Vince seem to, in fact, to compare those two discourses around uh, the notions of what, you know, of the authentic text uh, as opposed to you know the filmic text. 